Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. I've really been thinking recently about our relationship with food and how intimate of a relationship it is. We think about intimate relationships being with you know, the people in our lives, significant other, but food is a truly intimate relationship because we're taking something from the outside world and putting it into our bodies, all right? Name one thing that's more impactful and intimate than that because as my guest today said, food isn't just food, food is information. So what we're taking in from the outside world in the form of food is informing every single cell, our DNA, our genes on what to do, on how to express themselves, on how to build proteins, on how to uh, move hormones and neurotransmitters throughout our system to communicate, cholesterol building, and uh, the transport of those things, our liver function, our brain function, all of it is intimately impacted by every single bite of food we eat. It's a big thing, very powerful. And this is something we come out of the womb knowing how to do. We come out consuming, we come out ready to eat. Now for many of us, we have El Nipple as our first source of food, you know, mother's milk. And, but today it's, you know, our system is a little bit different. Our society is different. There's, there was a time, things are shifting. There's a time when uh, mother's milk was pushed in science to be inadequate and formula was actually pushed as, as the ideal first food for babies. Now we've cleared up our misconceptions about that. We know that mother's milk is the most valuable thing for newborn babies, but even soon there are after we are bringing in different foods. And through our evolution, it will be a wide variety of different foods. But again, in recent years, in our recent culture, that variety has begun to become more and more and more minimal. And the impacts on our health have become a place where we're seeing disease and obesity at a place of epidemic proportions. And I think that a big part of this is just kind of, if, if I'm thinking about the way that I grew up, I grew up in an environment where I didn't really know that there was a difference in the food that I ate. I didn't know that there was a difference between a fast food hamburger and a wild caught salmon or broccoli or a candy bar. I just thought it was stuff you eat. And growing up in the environment that I did, even in high school, we'd have a lunch line where there's like the meal of the day, you know, you got the mystery meat, you know, what, what is it? I don't know. But, you know, the lunch lady would be doling out, preparing some stuff in the back, but it's largely, you know, processed foods from not the best sources, most likely. But predominantly, most kids, I'd say nine out of 10 kids are going through the fast food lines, right? Getting our burgers, getting our pizza. I'd say five days out of the school week, four days I'm eating the little personal pizza, and I'd also get a pretzel with cheese. I didn't really care too much for the pretzel. I needed that cheese. I needed that cheese whiz hitter to dip my pizza in. And that was my fuel for the day, you know, and maybe have a soda or a juice or the soda companies were actually on our school campus in high school, doling out and giving away samples of their new products whenever they come out. Surge was one that hit when I was in high school, right? It was just supposed to be this uh, energy drink slash soda. How on earth are they able to come and to infiltrate our bodies and our minds of our students on a, on a high school campus like that? It's wildly inappropriate. But the thing is, if we're not aware, we're really not aware because I just saw it as like, oh, this is cool, right? We got free samples. One of the biggest drawing points for so many people, especially if you're growing up in poverty, is my favorite price, which is free. If it's free, I'll, I'll have some of that, right? And that's something that can fuel you, get you to another day, but it's also potentially fueling chronic illness because many of the programs that are designed to support people's health and wellness are actually uh, largely giving food from government subsidies and also uh, giving access to highly processed foods. And so how do we break the cycle? How do we really figure out how to get healthy food into people's hands, into their communities, and that's why I'm so excited about this episode today, to change the culture in our schools and in our communities at large. And this book and this project from our guest, Dr. Mark Hyman, is a total game changer. So I'm really, really excited to have him on today. And uh, just really quickly, one of the things that I've learned about in recent years, you know, 
it's been easily over a decade that I've been really trying to help to break down the misconceptions about dietary fat. But only recently in the last few years has medium chain triglycerides or MCTs become very popular and something that people are really striving to get a nutritive source of these MCTs. And part of the reason is that medium chain triglycerides have this really interesting ability to be able to cross the blood brain barrier and to feed your brain cells. There's only a couple of dozen nutrients that have that ability of the hundreds, even thousands of nutrients, many that we still don't even know yet. Only a, only a few dozen have the ability to actually go into the VIP section in your brain via crossing over that blood brain barrier and feeding your brain cells. That's pretty freaking remarkable. And that's just part of it. And another part of the MCT oils lure, lure is the fact that MCTs also trigger your body to produce more ketones. And ketones are also known to be able to fuel our brain cells. Not, not all of our brain cells can utilize ketones or MCTs. Some is, is driven by uh, glucose, right? But many of our processes for our brains can be driven by these cleaner burning fuel sources. And this is just one of the reasons that I'm a huge fan of MCT oils. And many people today, as you probably know, are swapping out their morning you know, bagel or their morning, you know, muffin, and they're going for these kind of upgraded coffees and having, you know, these, quote, elixirs, you know, these different mushroom teas and coffees and things like that, and adding MCT oil to the mix. And I'm a big fan of emulsified MCT oils because it's kind of like a coffee creamer and they taste amazing. They make the process of enjoying these MCT oils and driving you to get them in your body. Uh, so much more attractive. And now here's one of the real reasons why this is a great swap right now. According to data cited in the International Journal of Obesity and Related Metabolic Disorders, MCTs have been found to boost the oxidation of stored body fat while increasing satiety at the same time. Again, there are very few things that can do both. Get you a fat that can do both, all right? It increases satiety and helps you to burn fat at the same time. There are very few things that can do that. MCT oils is one of those things. And so definitely pop over there to onit.com forward slash model. Get yourself some emulsified MCT oil. They also have their original MCT oil as well. It's from high quality sources. This is coconut derived and it's also fair trade and organic, all the good stuff that we're really looking for when we're getting products like these. They're doing it the best way possible. And this is why I'm a huge fan. I have MCT oils every single day. Highly, highly recommend you pop over to check them out. You get 10% off as well. And my favorite is the almond milk latte. My wife loves the vanilla. Do yourself a favor, get on the MCT oils and you can add them to your coffee. You can add them to smoothies. You can add them to your favorite tea and just upgrade the nutrition. All right, onit.com forward slash model. It's O-N-N-I-T dot com forward slash model. And now let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled Joy by Lana Loves Jesus. Dear Sean, my name is Lana, and I'm writing to say that your podcast is a huge part of why I feel so much joy in my daily life. I always share about your podcast with people wherever I go. I'm a better person because of it. There needs to be more people like you in the world. Thankfully, you are here doing your part, impacting people's lives. Please continue to share more amazing content. I am so blessed to have came across your podcast. God bless your biggest fan, Lana. Lana, thank you so much for sharing that review over on Apple Podcasts. That just really filled me up and put a big smile on my face. I really, really appreciate that. And listen, if you've yet to do so, please pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show. And just whatever platform you're listening on, leave a review. If you're watching on YouTube with us hanging out in the studio, make sure to leave a comment and let me know what you thought about this episode and our special guests. And on that note, let's get to our special guests and our topic of the day. Our guest today is Dr. Mark Hyman, who's a practicing family physician and an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate in the field of functional medicine. He's the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, the head of strategy and innovation of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, a 12-time New York Times bestselling author, and board president for clinical affairs for the Institute 
for functional medicine. He's the host of one of the leading health podcasts, The Doctor's Pharmacy, spelled with an F, pharmacy. Dr. Mark Hyman is a regular medical contributor to several television shows and networks, including CBS This Morning, Today Show, Good Morning America, The View, and CNN. He's also an advisor and guest co-host on The Dr. Oz Show. And he's back here on The Model Health Show to talk about his new project, which I think you're absolutely going to love. So let's jump into this conversation with the amazing Dr. Mark Hyman. So why this book now? Why Food Fix? Uh, why talk about social injustice issues around food, the food system? Why now? Why now? Because people need to understand that our food system is the biggest driver of most of the problems on the planet that, that is driving challenges for most of the things that matter most to us. Mm. Our health, our economic ability to thrive, mm. uh, the climate change that's happening, environmental destruction, uh, poverty, violence, depression, poor academic performance, national security, they're all connected by food and no one's told the story. Not only do people not understand that it's all one problem, but they don't understand that there's elegant, simple solutions that can fix all of it. So while it's kind of depressing to think about it, it's also extremely hopeful because we have the power to change this by leveraging policy change, grassroots movements, business innovations, citizen action, all of it is, is so critical for our future. I mean, it's an existential threat. And when you lay it all out and tell the story as one story, yeah. uh, it, it, it all makes sense. So yeah. we, we think of things as separate, right? We think, you know, our economy is one thing. Health is another thing. Climate is another thing. Social justice is another thing. You know, kids' academic performance is another thing. The thing that ties them all together, and obviously isn't the only reason for the problems, but is the major reason, yeah. is our food system. Yeah. We tend to compartmentalize things, period. Mm -hmm. You know, even when it comes to our health and our bodies, yeah. you know, you got somebody for this thing, got somebody for that thing, like we're yeah. separate. Yeah. And you it's functional out, medicine yeah. for everything. <laughs> <It's like laughs> right. How exactly. to connect the systems view. Or it's a systems view. Yeah. I think one of the most kind of eye opening things about the book and about what you're putting out for everybody is the fact that we know now today that food is the number one cause of death. Yeah. In our world today. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It is crazy. I mean, it happens so fast. I mean, in 1960, 5% of our population was obese. Now, in most states, it's 40%. That's staggering. Yeah. You know, that's an eight-fold change. An eight that's obese, not eating. Yeah, that's, not, yeah, that's obese. That's yeah. not just a little overweight. Yeah. And, and over the last 40 years, it's happened, and we've seen staggering rates of disease, obesity, diabetes, and all the related complications. And, and people just just had it coming out of nowhere and, and we're not really equipped to deal with it. So the reason this book is so important, it sort of says, wait a minute, we need to catch up. We need to stop, take a look around, see the big problems we're facing and come up with real models to solve it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 11 million people die every year from eating bad food. I think that's an underestimate and yeah. not eating enough good food, right? It's a Six it's out of two epidemic. Americans are sick with a chronic illness. One out of two have prediabetes or type two diabetes. 75% are overweight. This is all caused by food. Yeah. Food is the biggest cause. It's also the biggest cure for our problems. Yeah, yeah. And this is a global epidemic Global. Now. I mean, and you talk about that 80% too. of the world's diabetics are in the developing world. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. And they're suffering from malnutrition and obesity and all the problems of this double burden of obesity and malnutrition. Yeah. Let's talk about that specifically because that's really fascinating that we live at a time where there are so many people who are hungry, you know, mm, they're going to bed mm, hungry, mm. but then we have more people than ever who are overweight at the same time. Yeah, we have like over two, probably three point, two point three billion people who go to bed overweight and about 800 million, which is a lot, who go to bed hungry. And yet we have more than enough calories to feed 10 billion people on the planet, even today, even yeah. though we have 7 billion. And because we throw out 40% of our food, yeah. we waste it. And, and the right food isn't getting to the right people in the right places and too much is getting to the people who don't need it and you're getting this sort of incredible uneven uh, problem where where the amount of calories you produce is probably an extra 300 calories for every man woman and child on the planet a day than they need yeah. but yet there's still these disparities and, and there's a lot of reasons for it but you know we have to solve this problem because never before I mean I remember like seeing a picture of Woodstock recently and looked around the entire picture like 
thousands of people. There wasn't one person that was overweight. I saw the Aretha Franklin movie, Amazing Grace, and looked at this African-American church in, I think it was in Oakland, 1970. There wasn't one person who was overweight. And, and today, 80% of African-American women are overweight. And their diabetes rates are twice that of whites. Their amputation rates are four times. Uh, sorry, their kidney failure is four times that of whites. And their amputation rates are three and a half times. So these enormous health disparities are, are affecting these populations. And we just, we just didn't see, we just didn't see this a generation ago. And, and it's like, it's like a tsunami that came so fast that everybody was asleep. And now it's like, whoa, wait a minute. And people still haven't woken up to it. Yeah. And I want to talk more about the disparity in a moment, but I don't want to go past, you mentioned food waste. Mm. Can you talk more about that? Because it's yeah. really eye opening. Yeah. If you don't think about it, nobody's for food waste, right? People are against different things, whether we should, you know, be using more GMO or not, but nobody's for food waste. And we waste 40% of the food uh, that we grow. And it would be, it, we would need the entire land mass of China to grow that food every year. It's $2 trillion of food waste about $1,800 a person in America for every fam person in America we waste. And uh, it's about a pound a day per person. And that, what happens that waste? First of all, all the inputs that go into it, growing it, the seeds, the energy, the water, the labor, the processing, distributing, marketing, selling, all that is wasted, refrigeration, everything. And on top of that, when we throw it out, it goes into landfills. Now, people don't realize this, but even if you're a vegan and you're throwing out your scraps and your leftovers, Let's go into a landfill, and that's creating a massive contribution to climate change. Mm. I mean, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the U.S. and China. <laughs> it's like a massive problem. And it's really, it, for, it basically rots and releases methane, which is 25 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Yeah. So we, we must solve this food waste problem. And the thing is, we all can do something about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, in San Francisco, when Gavin Newsom was the mayor... He put in a mandatory composting law. So it's mandatory now. You can't throw out your food waste. It has to go in a compost bucket. Just like there's recycling, there's trash, and there's compost. Yeah. And in the airport, there's compost buckets. Um, and it's fantastic. And, and, and the same thing they did in, in the Massachusetts. They eliminated any ability of a company to throw out their garbage if they if their food waste. It was more than a ton a week. So places like Whole Foods and grocery stores and food service companies can't just throw it all out. So they're forced to do something with it. And, they, and there's been a great innovation around. This is what's so exciting to me about America. You've got great innovation. So dairy farmers were not making much money. They realized that they can get this food waste, which they can get for free, basically. They build these anaerobic digesters where they put in the food waste and some manure, like the dairy poop, which is you know a big contributor, again, greenhouse gases, in this big digester that actually produces electricity for 1,500 homes Come on. and makes him an extra $100,000 a year. And those farmers are struggling making less than 1800 minus $1,800 a year, right? So it's a win, 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 win. And, and you know, they're doing this in Europe. There's 17,000 of these anaerobic digesters in Europe. We don't do that, but we could be producing electricity, dealing with food waste, climate change, manure. I mean, it's a sort of a win, win. And, and we need to do that on our individual basis yeah. with compost. Even if you live in an apartment, you can have a little compost uh, unit that you can actually buy on Amazon for a few bucks and actually throw all your scraps in there and it turns into soil. You can give it away to somebody who's got a garden. You can, you know, local compost facilities. And it's just a powerful, simple thing that we can do to end food waste. But it's, it's one of the biggest problems we have. And then, thankfully, the EPA, the FDA, and the USDA have banded together under the Trump administration. One of the few things they've done is really awesome and created an initiative around food waste. Because again, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, nobody's for throwing out more food and creating all these problems. Yeah. It's so important. And I love that we give these very actionable items for everybody throughout the book. Yeah. So composting, this is something that, you know, I didn't even really think about. Yeah. I see it out different places. Yeah. And also it's addressing one of the other big issues to talk about is our soil and our yes. deficit of oh, soil. Yeah. Talk about that. Okay. So, uh, you know, most people think, oh, you know, how do we grow our food? Where do we get it from? So it doesn't matter. Right. But it turns out that how we grow our food determines one, the quality of the food we eat, right? The nutrients in it, whether it's full of chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, glyphosates, and fertilizer stuff. Um, but also the soil is the biggest carbon sink on the planet. You know, it literally can hold three times the amount of carbon that's been released into the environment at over a trillion tons of carbon. Mm. And, and the truth is the way we grow food 
industrial monocrops, commodities, soy, wheat, corn, has depleted our soil through over tilling, soil erosion, intensive chemical use, which destroys the organic matter, the life of the soil, and turn it into dirt, which is lifeless. And the soil that, that we've lost is one third of all our topsoil in the, in the last 150 years. And something about, that took millions of years to million, make. Billions, I don't know, million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it just in natural processes, it takes about, I think, a thousand years to create like three centimeters of topsoil. Right, so it's like a slow process. With animals, we can actually do it much faster. But, but when you think about it, thirty to forty percent of all greenhouse gases up in the environment that are causing climate change are the result of damage to our soils. That's staggering. We think it's fossil fuels. We think it's cars yeah. and planes. No, it's dirt. And we actually know that we can solve this problem by fixing soil. Uh, you know, soil is the biggest carbon sink on the planet, and it and we can use this incredible carbon capture technology that works better than any technology currently invented that's available everywhere in the world it's free mm. it drives huge amounts of carbon capture more than all the rainforests on the planet and all the trees on the planet and it's called photosynthesis yeah. <laughs> and essentially it's this ancient technology where plants breathe carbon dioxide right they they release oxygen in the atmosphere which is what we breathe but they they actually in this beautiful cycle, it's like a beautiful symbiotic cycle, they breathe in carbon dioxide, it goes into the plants, into the roots, into the soil, and puts all this organic matter in the soil, feeds the fungi, feeds the bacteria, creates this incredibly rich, nutrient-dense soil, allows the plants to extract the nutrients from the soil. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you have dead soil and you throw on fertilizer, it can't extract the nutrients. Our, even your best organic broccoli, if it's not grown in rich organic soil, is actually got 50% less nutrients than it did 50 years ago. Yeah. So you could be eating whole foods, plant-based foods. They're not full of zinc and selenium and iron and magnesium and all the nutrients that come from the soil because the, the microbiology of the soil is what helps to extract those nutrients so the plants can consume them right. and we can eat them. But if there's, if there's no organic matter, we can't do that. And the, the other thing is when you... When you do that, you can literally draw down enough carbon to save us from climate change. The UN estimated that that if we just spent $300 billion over the next few years, which is about the 60-day spend on military spending globally, just two months of military spending, we could slow down climate change and give us 20 more years to figure it out because mm -hmm. it draws down that much carbon if we took just 2 million of the 5 million degraded hectares around the world and turn it into regenerative agriculture, which, which I can explain more. But regenerative agriculture essentially is a way of building soil. Yeah, soil is a solution. It is, soil, not oil. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's yeah. unbelievable, and it, and, it, and it means we need to use less chemicals or none. Fertili it actually makes its own fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It holds water, right? So we're seeing all these droughts and floods and flooded farmlands. And why is that? Because the soil is so crappy, it can't hold water. But if you have organic matter in the soil, it can hold 27,000 gallons per acre for every 1% organic matter, which means that if you built up a lot of organic matter, you can literally prevent damage from floods and droughts and all these problems that we're seeing all over the world that are actually threatening our food supply. Yeah. I want to talk more about that because I think that there was two really important words. There's a difference between dirt and soil. Soil, yes. The soil is that complex entity yeah. that you just described. Yeah. But the question is, how did we get here? How did we lose so much of the soil? Yeah. And one of the things you highlight, I've talked about this a couple of times, but you know, the monocropping. Yes. Just, there's been such yeah. a loss of our diversity of food. Yeah. So, so what what's happened is that we we had good intentions. You know, we needed to grow more food, feed hungry people. So we got really good at, at industrial production of starchy calories, wheat, corn, soy, and so forth. And that's industrial monocrop and chemical intensive agriculture. So we had big tractors. I mean, we just didn't know the consequences of that when we started. It was all based on good intentions. And now it's actually killing us. And the monocrop, basically the way these farms work is the methods they used, the tilling, which turns over the soil, causes soil erosion, disrupts the organic matter in the soil, disrupts all the complex life in the soil, kills it essentially, is a huge contributor. Not using cover crops, so leaving ground bare and fallow, also causes more soil erosion and doesn't allow nutrients to be put back in the soil. Crop rotations are important to actually yeah. feed the soil different things. So different plants, for example, certain plants like the nitrogen fixing plants, like the legumes and so forth, they'll put nitrogen back in the soil. So you don't need nitrogen fertilizer. 
and other other plants put other nutrients in the soil and you use uh so crop rotations cover crops no tilling methods and then animals now whether you're vegan or you eat meat doesn't matter you absolutely need animals to restore soil how we got 50 feet of topsoil in america was we had literally tens of millions of ruminants buffalo elk antelope deer grazing around and pooping and peeing and digging up and they built up 50 feet of topsoil they weren't causing climate change there were way more ruminants then than there are factory farm cows now it's the way we're doing it yeah. right so we're growing all this food for these animals we're destroying the soil and we're ending up with incredibly lifeless soil and when you need have lifeless soil you need way more inputs yeah so we've killed the soil so much that we need the fertilizers are two-thirds as effective and we have been using seven times more fertilizer to get the same results because it's like you know beating you know trying to get blood out of a stone mm. and, and, and you know dirt doesn't hold water it doesn't provide uh, a rich microbial life that actually helps the plants become more nutritious it doesn't hold carbon which means you know it contributes to climate change so while damage to the soil is one of the biggest contributors to climate change it also can suck out the carbon from the environment better than anything else. And, and there's so much degraded land, 5 million hectares of degraded land around the world, that we can convert into regenerative lands. Lands that can't be used to grow vegetables. Even if you're a vegan, you know, you can't grow plants on certain land. And the animals upcycle the nutrients and produce incredibly nutrient-dense food and help restore climate and fix the soil. And, and you know, there's a great example of this. There's a guy named Gabe Brown from North Dakota who's a farmer whose farm was destroyed by hail and bad weather and he was going to go bankrupt and he started reading about these principles and said he was going to try it. And since he's tried it on his 5,000 acres in North Dakota, he's created a complex ecosystem on his farm, not a monocrop, single plant or one or two plants like corn and soy. He says he's built 29 inches of soil he uses no inputs. He actually makes his own fertilizer. He produces better quality food. He's more resilient to climate stress and weather, mm -hmm. floods and droughts and so forth, because the soil is so rich and hold so much water. And he says he makes 20 times the profit mm -hmm. of his neighbor, Unbelievable. which is staggering. So yeah. it's good for him, good for the planet. And there's, and there's businesses that are figuring this out. You know, it's not a hippie fad and it can be scaled. It's estimated that we could literally produce twice as many cattle that way as we can through factory farms right now. Yeah. And, and uh, there's, there's private equity companies like Farmland LP, which essentially buys up conventional farms, converts them to regenerative farms, and takes them from single digit profits to double digit profits. Their, their first fund was, had a 67% return. Like, I'd like to invest in that. Yeah, that's you know, that's like a crazy of. amount of return. And there's something called ecosystem services. So humans are really good at using up natural capital, natural resources. And we use about $125 trillion a year of natural resources from the earth. We basically steal it. <laughs> and we don't give it back. And, and, and we destroy the soil. We destroy the water. We you know, take down the trees, all that stuff. The, the way of farming with the regenerative farming, which will fix the quality of the food, the obesity, the chronic disease, the economic issue, the climate issues, the environmental biodiversity loss, all of it gets fixed by that. Uh, it actually adds 21 in this one little uh, small bunch of farms. They, they added $21 million of ecosystem benefit or services to the environment, whereas the conventional farms cost $8 million. And, and there, are, there are now countries like Costa Rica that are paying farmers to put carbon in the soil to conserve water, to actually increase biodiversity. And I think that's what's going to have to happen in this country. We're going to have to incentivize farmers to do the right thing. Yeah. So it makes it more profitable and, and everybody wins. Yeah, I love that. And you talk about, because for business sake, it's going to look at what's the bottom line, yeah. you know, moving profits. It's an economic and you issue. pointed out so many times in the book and how people can make money. But one of the things that, <laughs> one of the things that's really important that I want everybody to really imbibe is this um, biodiversity. You yeah. know, because we go to a grocery store and it looks like there's all these different foods, yeah. but it's really, a lot of the right same, now, like 90% yeah. of the stuff on store shelves is made from like the same 12 foods. Yes, Right. Exactly. So we got like to sell 12, the same 12 yeah. plants and five animal species. Whereas I think yeah. we've lost yeah. so much over the last hundred years of we, our diversity. I mean, we, we, we used to eat 800 species of plants. I mean, at the turn of the century, there were hundreds and hundreds of apple varieties, right? In America, uh, complex different grains. 
many, many, many different complex livestock, heirloom breeds, right? Now we've lost 90% of our edible plant species, half of all our livestock species, and 75% of pollinators, like butterflies and bees, bees, which we can't grow food if we don't have that. Einstein said, if we lose our bees, we have four years left to live, you know, which is pretty scary. And why is that happening? Well, a lot of reasons, because of the consolidation of seed production with seed monopoly companies like Bayer, Monsanto, ChemChina, Syngenta, and so are BASF, um, but also because you know, we are destroying the biodiversity through how we grow food. The chemical intensive agriculture destroys the soil microbiology. It, it actually leads to loss of pollinators because pesticides aren't selective, right? They'll kill yeah. insects of all kinds. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, we've hybridized animals to so these really productive breeds like cows, for example. I mean, look, if you have an heirloom grass finished cow, regeneratively raised cow, which is how they all were, like this is how it used to be, right? It's, it's actually got a different form of, uh, of, of nutrients in it that are much better for you, like CLA, which is a great anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, metabolism-boosting fat. It has more antioxidants, more minerals, more nutrients, less bad fats. But also, you know, the dairy, for example, you know, we used to have A2 A2 casein cows, which are the heirloom cows. You travel around the world, you see all these funny-looking cows. We have the same looking cow. Every cow looks the same here. They're all like white and black Holstein cows that produce the same kind of milk. But it's inflammatory. It's been hybridized in a way that creates a lot of problems for people. And so we, we, we aren't eating things in a way that are, are the best quality. I mean, the things that have been bred for, you know, stability, transport, not for taste, not for nutrient density. Uh, you know, my friend Dan Barber is, a, is an incredible uh, chef. And he's like, why can't we breed plants for flavor? Because nobody's bred for they bred, bred for yield, they're bred for pest resistance, they're bred for shipping, they're mm -hmm. bred. For, but nobody's like, how about for nutrients? I mean, right. when there's flavor, that's where the nutrients are, right? right? Because that's the indicator. What, of that's the indicator, right? The phytochemicals and all. And so you created like you know honey nut squash, for example, which is instead of a, a sort of soggy, mostly water butternut squash, is like incredibly flavorful, rich thing. And so, you know, we we actually can start to bring back some of these plants. Mm, I love that. I love and, that. And there's a whole there's seed vaults where we can we can resurrect these things that are more local location and climate specific. And a friend of mine discovered by accident he, he wanted to get some new kind of crops growing. He was working with a farmer, and the USDA sent him by accident this packet of of uh, seeds. And he's like, "What are these seeds? It's like four two one three six whatever whatever." And he's like, "Oh yeah, these are the Himalayan buckwheat." They're incredibly, mm. you know, strong plants, but they're among the most nutrient dense food on the planet. They're very low in starch, high in protein, full of phytochemicals, vitamins and minerals. They grow in incredibly tough conditions. I mean, these are the kinds of things we should be eating. Yeah, and that diversity in the soil is also indicator number one, like you mentioned, of the nutrients that we get. Yeah. But I think it's a good parallel to the microbiome diversity for ourselves. That yeah. We're in fact, there's amazing research on how our own microbiome and the microbiome of the soil are connected and dependent on each other, right? Mm. So, you know, there's this, people write this book called Eat Dirt, you know, for example, it's like, yeah, I mean, I think we, we used to have much more intimate contact with our natural environment, live outside, you know, have dirty fingers when we ate, I mean, you know, you know it wasn't, there wasn't, uh, you know, uh, Purell, you know, everywhere. Right, walking out of any door. <laughs> yeah, and it's <laughs> like, uh, and I, I think it's, uh, it's so important and it screwed up our immune system. And so there's so much uh, incredible potential for, you know, getting a better health for ourselves through taking care of the soil. It's all one system. In fact, there's a great book I read when I was like 19 called The Soil and Health, written by Sir Albert Howard, who was the father of organic agriculture in 1947. And he says that the whole, um, the whole problem of health in, you know, plant, animal, you know, soil, and humans is one great subject. It's all one problem, right? My question always goes to how did this happen? Like, why is this allowed? You know, we know that many pesticides, insecticides, these are estrogenic, neurogenic. These are things that are proven to have problems once yeah, we consume sure. them. And yeah. also missing on the diversity in our foods, the, the processed foods that we have. Why is it that the, how does our, our protection or the FDA why is it that the FDA has allowed this to happen? Well, like I said, a lot of these were, were started out as good intentions and had great effects. They, they reduced you know, hunger, they reduced starvation, they proved a lot of you know, calorie-dense, starchy foods, um, but produced them in a way that's had all these bad consequences. And, and 
what happened then is these companies got so big. You know, there used to be like 100 seed companies. Now there's four that control 60% of our seeds. Problem. You know, there used to be like 100 food companies. Now there's like nine that own all the other ones. And there used to be, you know, lots of fertilizer companies. Now there's like half a dozen that control all the 400 billion pounds of fertilizer made every year. Uh, so there's a big consolidation and these have enormous power. I mean, it's a $15 trillion industry. It's the number one business sector in the world. It's about 17% of our global economy. And it's controlled by a few dozen CEOs that are, you know, committed to protecting their shareholder value yeah. and selling more stuff. I mean, the way Coca-Cola makes more money is selling more Coke. Yeah. You know, maybe they're selling more water and trying to diversify their products and all that's great. But it's 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 a problem. And so there's an enormous amount of lobbying and influence. Uh, and, and, and the way the food company controls the narrative is through multiple strategies that I outline in the book. One, they corrupt science. So they fund... 12 times as much science as, as funded by the government. And it's like Gatorade, oh, it's good for you, and let's fund it by Pepsi, you know, and Coca-Cola doesn't cause obesity, funded by Coca-Cola. Sugar's not a problem, funded by the coalition of, you know, big food companies. Uh, it it co-ops scientists um, in different ways by the, funding their professional associations, the American Heart Association, the American mm. Diabetes Association, Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, all are funded in part by the food industry. And by the ag industry, and so they're 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 not actually completely independent. They shouldn't be making guidelines and recommendations. And then you have front groups that they create to confuse the public, like the American Council on Science and Health, which essentially says that GMO is fine, that pesticides are not harmful, that smoking is okay, and high fructose corn syrup is good for you. I mean, it's kind of almost ridiculous, but they they present themselves as this independent group. When you look at who's funding them, it's all big food. So you've got all these front groups, and then they co-op social groups like the NAACP and Hispanic Federation are funded in part by the food industry, which is why those groups who are the most targeted and affected by the food industry and the soda and processed food are the ones who are opposing soda taxes and opposing food reforms, you know, mm. because uh, of how they're funded. Yeah. Now, where I spoke once, uh, I was with Bernice King, Martin Luther King's daughter in Atlanta, and I wanted to present this movie, Fed Up at the King Center, which was all about how sugar and food was causing all this obesity in kids and stuff. And, and uh, she was all into it. You know, she says, nonviolence means nonviolence to ourselves. And, and a few days later, I got a call. We can't show the film. I'm like, why? She says, well, because Coca-Cola funds the King Center in Atlanta. <laughs> they, they, gave a, they gave a million dollars in the Super Bowl to uh, create free admission to the you know, Social Justice, Human Rights, uh, Civil Rights uh, Museum in, in Atlanta. <laughs> it's like, yeah. they know what they're doing. And Absolutely. then on top of that, there's 187 lobbyists for every member of Congress. So they control science, they control public health groups, they control social groups, they fund research, and they control politics. So yeah. 187 lobbies from every member of Congress. Just on the anti-GMO labeling law, they, they fought that, and, and it was $192 million in one year that these, com these companies spent to oppose that one piece of legislation. They spent $500, billion, $500 million on the Farm Bill 600 lobby groups. I mean, they have so much power. And and I remember sitting on a boat with a senator this summer and, and a sailboat, and we had two hours just chat. And, you know, I started laying all this out for him. And he was like, his jaw was open. He just didn't understand this because he doesn't get educated by people like me. He gets educated by the food industry. Right. You know, it's like of pharma course. companies. They educate doctors on, you know, I call it continuing pharmaceutical education instead right. of medical education. So this is why we have this problem. Yeah. And then we have policies that are so contradictory. You know, we have food stamps where we're basically providing 75% of the food stamps, which is a lot of money, about $75 billion a year, is for junk food. And 10% of that is for soda, about $7 billion a year, about $30 billion servings to the poor every year of soda. Uh, we have dietary guidelines that are corrupted because now the Trump administration says we can't look at any research on ultra processed foods. We can't actually look at research before 2000. We can't look at research from independent scientists, only the USDA. I mean, but all these crazy restrictions on what you can look at, which kind of waters down the guidelines. You know, we have school lunch program. Obama tried to improve school lunches and he did through the Hang Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, but then Trump has just rolled it all back. And now kids can, you know, have pizzas and vegetable, French fries are vegetable, ketchup is a vegetable. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. Yeah, and I want to talk about that specifically and how this, our, our culture, our food culture really starts and our connection with food in school and how the, the food system is playing out for our kids. And we're going to do that right after this quick break, so sit tight, we'll be right back. 
there's a huge wave taking place right now with folks stepping up to try to find how to get a mental edge. There's never been more competition. There's never been more people vying for attention and looking for creativity and performance and finding ways to really stand out. And so priming and optimizing brain health is truly the wave of the future right now. And for that, folks are really tuning in to this category of nootropics. Now, nootropics are a category of supplements, drugs, other substances that can improve cognitive function, be it memory, executive function, motivation, things like that. But we want to keep in mind that your brain is really operating on a system that has literally millions of years of evolution behind it. So throwing in a new smart drug that was created, you know, last week might not be a good idea. So we want to lean into what are some of the things that have historical use that are also clinically proven to be effective for optimizing and improving the function of our brain when we're talking about mental performance. And so for that, I want you to know about a study that was published in Evidence-Based Complementary and Alternative Medicine that found that this little secret, listen in, raw honey possesses nootropic effects such as memory enhancing attributes as well as neuropharmacological activities such as antidepressant activities and anxiolytic effects so helping to reduce anxiety i don't know how they could do that All right but listen to this honey polyphenols are also directly involved in activities that help to reduce neuroinflammation so we're talking about reducing inflammation in the brain now this is another thing that has a parallel wave taking place with inflammation and disorders of inflammation taking place throughout our body systemic inflammation but also the brain specifically which is connected to issues like dementia and alzheimer's but also just poor mental performance and so honey has that capability as well but the key is raw honey the study says raw honey now with this we need to be careful we need to be mindful and for me this is why i look to beekeepers naturals to get my honey because they're dedicated to sustainable beekeeping and also they have third-party testing for over 70 pesticide residues that are found in common bee products like honey bee pollen and the list goes on and on now some of those things that are in conventional honeys include arsenic, lead, mercury, E. coli. Not a good, not a good. So we want to behave and make sure that we get our honey. So they have incredible superfood honey. They have a, a chill, be chill honey also that has hemp in the honey as well. But they have some incredible products that, again, you're getting your medicine, you're getting your nootropic benefits without the harmful stuff on the backside. Now, if we're talking about nootropics, this one specifically you have to know about. There was a study published in Advanced Biomedical Research that found that royal jelly, royal jelly has the potential to improve spatial learning, attention, and memory. Royal jelly, that's what the queen bee eats. All right, it's exclusively the royal jelly. All right, so this is taking honey, and this is supercharging it. This is taking honey, and doing a fast and furious with it, all right? This is the Vin Diesel version. Now, Royal Jelly also has antimicrobial, anti-tumor, and anti-inflammatory properties as well. And Royal Jelly has been found to facilitate the differentiation of all types of brain cells, so helping your brain to create the cells that it needs. And to top it off, researchers in Japan recently discovered that Royal Jelly has the power to stimulate neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So this is the memory center of your brain, literally creating new brain cells. I'm telling you, there are not many nootropics out there that can do something like that. And the Bee Elixir product that Beekeepers Naturals has is phenomenal. It's called B. Elixir, L-X-R, incredible. The basis is royal jelly, but they also have one of my all-time favorite things in there, Bacopa. Now listen to this, a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trial, gold standard of studies, Published in 2016, found that after just six weeks of use, Bacopa significantly improved speed of visual information processing, learning rate, memory consolidation, and even decreased anxiety in study participants. Try the B Lixer, all right? If you wanna boost your cognitive performance, it's something for you to you know, kick off your day to get focused. If you are about to go into a, a meeting or a performance or study, or you just want to improve the function of your brain, reduce inflammation, get your brain healthier. 
try the bee elixir. All right, go to beekeepersnaturals.com forward slash model. You get 15% off everything they carry. Again, I'm a huge fan of the superfood honey. Love the bee pollen. Bee elixir, game changer. All right, that's beekeepers natural. So that's B E E K E E P E R S naturals.com forward slash model for 15% off. And now back to the show. All right, we are back and we're talking with multi New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Mark Hyman about his new book, Food Fix. I got an advanced copy right here. You need to pick yours up ASAP. One of the most important books of our lifetime. And before the break- Thank you for that. <laughs> you're welcome. It's, I, you know, it's, it's the most important book I've truth. ever written, but yeah. yeah. Well, we're talking about a subject matter that matters a lot to me when we're talking about our kids mm. and how the food system is really preying on kids yes. and how they're, one of the things that you highlight is how they're getting into the food system in and of itself. And I just want to share this from your book. You noted that about 80% of our schools have contracts with soda companies. Yep. And, what? And, and and 50% have brand name junk food, fast food in their cafeteria. So it's, you know, it's uh, McDonald's Monday and Taco Bell Tuesday yep. and Wendy's Wednesday. And it's like, it's bad. Yep. And these kids are struggling in this country. We, we see 40% of kids overweight. We see one in 10 kids with ADD. We see behavioral issues. I mean, the amount of medications that are prescribed to children today is just frightening. And when when I was growing up, I'm 60 years old, there was that one troubled kid in the class. There was that one girl who was a little overweight, you know, and that was it. Yeah. And now it's the norm. Uniform, yeah. And, and what's happened is the food has changed so much that it's affecting kids' cognitive development. And their performance. We know that kids who are in low socioeconomic groups with poor diets, their brains are 10% smaller. Their IQs are seven points lower, which is a lot. And they're not functioning well in school. We see academic achievement gaps. There's something called the achievement gap, which is that kids who have struggles with health or diet or food, they do poorly. They earn less money when they grow up. They're more, less likely to go to college. I mean, I, I just went to one of the really underserved areas in Cleveland the other day and met with the the school superintendent and went through the school. It was a big school and it was mostly African-American and Hispanic kids. Uh, and 1%, he told me, 1% of these kids are eligible to go to college when they graduate high school. 40% absenteeism rate. The obesity rate's staggering. I walked down the hall, this very overweight girl walking down the hall with, you know, double fisting it. One giant 32 ounce slushy, another 32 ounce soda. And it was just the norm there. I went into the kitchen and I pointed out to him, where can you cook food here? There's deep fryers, there's reheating ovens, microwaves, that's it. So how do you actually have real food? And and what's great about what's happening in America today is there's innovation all over around this. There's, there's mothers and activists and people who are changing the school system. There's groups like Conscious Kitchen that create templates for schools to transform their schools to make food that tastes good, designed by top chefs within the nutrition school guidelines, within the budget. So it doesn't have to be expensive and kids will eat it. And I think that's what's really exciting now. We don't have to have this. And when you change diets for kids, they do better in school. There's less behavioral issues, less violence, less aggression, less conflict, less likely to go to jail. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing we don't think about. We have this, we have this very strong uh, approach of victim blaming in our culture, which you know instead of looking at the structure around things. How did this get created? Mm. And you talk about this in the book very eloquently. And we talked before the show that I'm doing something, I'm working on a project yeah. that's very big along the same lines. And when you outline this one particular study in the book, you noted that only about 5% of African Americans are getting adequate nutrition. Yeah. And it just like, I had to hold back the tears. I, like, I had to just sit there for a moment with that I'm and just, just realize that there's this structure, this concept that you're bringing to light called um, structural violence. Structural violence. Yeah. Structural violence. Talk about that. So, uh, Sean, when I uh, saw the earthquake happen in Haiti, I I had just finished reading this book called Mountains Beyond Mountains by a guy named Paul Farmer, who was in Haiti uh, for 30 years after medical school as a doctor, and and everybody had given up on this country because it was so corrupt. There was so much poverty. Uh, and there was so much disease, and there was TB and AIDS were rampant in Haiti. And all the public health groups, it's too hard to deal with these people. They're, they, don't, they're, 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 they can't take these medications on time and their schedule. And, and he, sort of, he, he went down there and he fixed it. And he said, it's not about uh, you know, these people 
having a medical problem. It's about the social, economic, and political conditions that drive disease. He called that structural violence. So what is the environment in which they live? Why are they so poor? How do we help them? So he basically created a model where he addressed this by creating community health workers, neighbors who helped each other take the drugs, make sure they got their health stuff done. And, and he was able to solve TB and AIDS in one of the worst places on the planet. It's the second poorest country in the world, uh, you know, in the, and the worst in the Western Hemisphere where people, most half the country lives on less than a dollar a day. He was able to deal with some of these structural issues, the social environment issues. And we know we call these social determinants of health in this country. And, and your zip code is more important determinant of your health than your genetic code. In, 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 in low socioeconomic areas, your life expectancy may be 20 years less or 30 years less. If you're poor African-American and living in a you know, tough area, you know, your health is at risk. Your life expectancy yeah. is dramatically lower. I mean, it's like the developing world here in the United States. And, and your zip code is a bigger determinant of your health. Uh, and it's, it's all the factors that drive that, whether you have access to food, whether you're, what your education is, whether you can walk in the streets or not because it's dangerous. You know, all these things play a huge role. Your, your lack of education about what's healthy to eat or not. Just to play the, the objective, you know, kind of devil's advocate, yeah. when people see that, because if I'm just looking at it from an outside perspective, it's just like, well, why don't you move? Or yeah. why don't you guys clean up your community and not understanding that, you know, I grew up. So a good example is when I met my wife, I was living in Ferguson, Missouri. I go out my door of the apartment complex. There's a liquor store immediately right across the street. And then as I go down the street, half a block, there's another liquor store, there's a Chinese food restaurant, not the good kind. There's yeah, like bad. the bulletproof glass kind. Yeah, yeah, right. And then there's Papa John's, Domino's, yeah. Dairy Queen. Yeah. And then I go down one other block, Krispy Kreme, McDonald's, yeah. Burger King, yeah. Yeah. another Chinese food place, another liquor Not an store. accident. You look at the concentration here's the thing. of these. Yeah. I didn't know that there was a difference. Yeah. I just thought it was food. I didn't know that healthy food was a thing. Yeah. It was a lack of exposure. Yeah, I think, you know, people are often judgmental and they go, well, people just know what to do. They're not doing it. They want. They don't really want to. They're lazy. Why don't they just you know get themselves together? It's just not like that. Yeah. I, I think you know people just don't know about the basics of nutrition. They're not taught in schools. They have no education. And the worst part about it is they're targeted. They're micro targeted by the food industry. How so? When you look, for example, at the targeting of ads, yeah, they're targeted to African Americans. They're targeted Hispanics. Uh, the advertising for, for example, soda on the day the food stamps come out in, in these poor neighborhoods is much higher. They are, they are uh, undermined in, in what they're doing by the food industry through, through designed targeted, targeted messaging communications. And th oh, sorry, I'm just going to take a drink. Oh, sure, sure, sure. And the data is so clear that you know these 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 they they put more of these junk food places and fast food places in poor neighborhoods. It's not an accident. It's it's actually by design, uh, and they hire celebrities, you know, Latino African American celebrities to promote all this junk. I mean, you think you think LeBron James drinks Sprite? Right. <laughs> I don't At think so. He, let me get that Sprite. So. No, and I know, and yeah. I'm involved with Life Like they put Gatorade and stuff. They actually don't drink it. They have the yeah. Gatorade bucket filled with another liquid. And I know this for a fact because I have friends who own sports teams and they tell me that's what they do. They have yeah. contracts with Pepsi and they have to put this out there, you know, so you can see it on TV, but it's actually not what's in the bucket. Yeah. So I think, I think you know, we see, you know, African-American kids drink twice as much soda as white kids because they're targeted. And, and, they, and the advertising, they see far more advertising for this on their media channels. And it's, yeah, you it's, note it in the book yeah. that black teens viewed 119% more junk food related ads, mostly for soda and candy, than uh, white teens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the health disparities are not an accident. And yeah. I think, like, again, they, they co opt social groups like black and Hispanic groups and other groups. And they, they are, they're so deliberate about it. And, and unfortunately, it, it, it's, it's this perpetual cycle that happens. And then, you know, it's tough for these families. I, mean, I remember a girl in Cleveland I met. She was going to the Fort Cayuga County Community Health um, uh, College there. And uh, they were studying food and you know, cooking, and they wanted to pull themselves up. And they were from really tough neighborhoods. She said her mother, I mean, her, her relatives were all having amputations. They had diabetes. You know, they were just, you know, really struggling. And, and she literally had to have her mother take two different buses to go for an hour to go get an hour each way to go get vegetables for the family if she wanted to eat vegetables meanwhile they had all the processed food they want the little debbies the sodas the drinks 
they don't even have like soda. It's like colored water. I mean, it's like, you know, neon green, neon blue, neon red, sugary liquid that they buy in these plastic containers full of phthalates that are, you know, pennies for, you know, a drink. And, uh, and it's killing them. And being in this situation, um, you know, even just growing up, having food stamps, and now, you know, they have the SNAP program, but we also had WIC as well. Women, Infants, and Children. Yeah, and so we'd get the, you know, uh, like skim milk. Yeah. And we'd get King Vitamin cereal. Not yeah. like, you know, the stuff we really wanted, but, you know, uh, white bread. We'd get some of these kind of basics, but we were just being, continuing with the malnutrition. And that's yeah. one of the things that you highlight as well, because there are people who are, and my, my most of my family's obese or overweight. Yeah. And, but yet they're also at the same time malnutritioned. So yes. how is that even possible? Yeah, well, we have too many calories and too few nutrients in our food, yeah. right? I mean, Coca-Cola has a lot of calories, but no nutrients, right? Broccoli has a lot of nutrients, but no calories, right? So we are eating a nutrient poor diet. And unfortunately, um, those abundance of nutrient poor calories leads to malnutrition. When you look at obesity, these patients are the most nutrient deficient. They're low in vitamin D, they're low in magnesium, they're low in zinc, they're low in folate, they're low in so many nutrients that we depend on for every biochemical reaction in our body. Yeah. People understand that you can be obese and malnourished. And then people yeah. want to eat more. You know, there's, there's a, a medical condition called pica, which is where kids will eat dirt if they're iron deficient, right? We look for nutrients because we're starving and our bodies crave those things. So we keep eating more and more food, trying to get more and more nutrients, but they're not there. So we just keep eating more food and get fatter and fatter and fatter. Yeah. And that shows up in different ways. I know people, you know, in my family that would eat chalk. Yeah. You know, I think during pregnancy, uh, another person was, was very uh, obsessed with eating soap. Wow. During pregnancy. Yeah. You know, it's just like your body no wants these nutrients. Yeah. And we're not getting it through our food. No. Mm -mm. And so we'll do these strange behaviors. It's and it so has weird. so much influence on their cognitive behavior, on their academic performance, on their mood, depression, behavior, violence, all those things yeah. are caused and, by these nutrient deficiencies. And you share several stories and, and really great studies in the book that are eye, super eye opening. I've said eye opening like three times. But this is really important because if we think about how the oppression is just, it becomes this very difficult cycle to break. Yeah. And we see, you know, nutrient deficiency, poor mental health, an increase in violent behavior. Yeah. And you share some studies showing that just getting people better nourished decreases their level of violence. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we know that your brain is dependent on the right fats, the right nutrients to work properly, to regulate your mood, your behavior, your energy, attention, and, and the, the, impact of it is, is so much further than we great much bigger than we realize uh, there's a study for example called the smile study where they did a randomized trial looking at feeding people a whole foods healthy diet compared to the traditional diet and it helped cure their depression we see in prison studies that feeding prisoners whole foods and better diet compared to the control group and these are these are controlled studies in a prison where they feed right. them so it's like they can track it all not like just somebody saying i ate this and you can't prove it they, they showed a 56% reduction in violent crime in the prisons. And if they added a multivitamin, they added an 80% violent crime reduction. They've done this in, with kids in, in juvenile centers where they see dramatic reductions in aggressive behavior, in oppositional behavior, in violence, in self-harming behaviors, 100% reduction in suicides, which is the biggest killer in youth right now, just from changing the diet. 100%. Yeah. Just <sighs> for, this is in this one study, just from eating better food. And, and when... You, you do that, it's so simple and it's so powerful and people don't understand the connection between food and mood and food and behavior. We eat such an inflammatory diet and our decisions and our choices aren't really very good. I just, I just uh, talked to my friend David Perlmutter who came out with a book called Brainwash where he talked about, he's a neurologist and he talked about what happens in the brain where the adult in the room who's good at making executive decisions and seeing consequences and mitigating bad behavior because we all have bad impulses, right? It's just being human, yeah. but it's like, okay, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to get in trouble if I steal that, right? right. It's, there's a part of the brain called the reptile brain, the limbic brain, the original uh, sort of fight or flight behaviors, you know, survival mechanisms. There's communication between those two parts of the brain. So when something 
I'll, you know, gets you activated, you go, oh, wait a minute, I'm not going to react yeah. like that. It's not I'm worth not going to say something stupid. I'm not going to punch this guy in the nose, even though he yeah. pissed me off. Like I, this guy really pissed me off the other night. I was at a party and he like stole my friend's seat and he was just a total dick about it. And I, I could feel myself, I wanted to punch him. I was like, okay, I'm going to behave okay, you know? Yeah. But what, what we see now in America is so much conflict, so much divisiveness, you know, yeah. whether it's Republican, Democrat, Christian, Muslim, whatever. And, and he said the parts of the brain that communicate get interrupted by an inflammatory diet, which is what we're talking about. Yeah. So the brain that can't function right when it's not eating the right diet. Yeah, this it seems like this should be Captain Obvious. It's very difficult to perspective take. It's very difficult to have compassion yeah. when you don't feel well. Yeah. You not. This is the thing. It's not that it's impossible. It's just harder. Yeah. And getting us well nourished is a big causative factor for change. And really quickly, and I just want to hit on some of these because yeah, yeah. I got to talk about some of the solutions. Let's You've got solutions Let's outlined so throughout much, the book. Yeah. I mean, I, so I do have. What are some of the things we can do? So, so yeah, we have a big problem. For sure. But the first step of fixing the problem is to recognize it. The second step is realizing we have so many potential ways to fix this. And that's the beauty of this. If you fix the root causes, you literally can change everything. And there's things that we as individuals can do, as citizens, business innovations, like I was talking about those incinerators for aerobic digesters for making electricity from garbage. Uh, there's policy change that we desperately need, and that's going to be a little harder, but we need to do it. And so I outline all these in my book, and on foodfixbook.com, there's a whole action guide where you can go and find all the things that you can do yourself. And just on a personal level, your diet matters. What you eat matters. And you don't have to become vegan, but you can think about how do I source from regenerative agriculture foods? You know, people say it's expensive, it's elitist. Well, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. There's a, for example, you can buy direct from, from ranchers, like at Mariposa Ranch where you can get eight bucks a pound regeneratively raised beef, which is cheaper for a four ounce serving than a McDonald's hamburger, right? And you can you can do this at scale if you maybe you can't afford the whole cow, so you buy, you go in with a bunch of friends in your neighborhood and you split it up and you chop it up and you put it in the freezer. Uh, everybody can start a compost pile, you know, which is something we don't think about, but uh, food waste is a terrible problem and we don't have to throw out our food scraps. You can get an in-home composter, you can get it if you live in an apartment, if you're in the country or live out in the suburbs, you can have a little compost pile in your backyard. I've had one for 40 years. You just throw the scraps in there and it just makes this incredible dirt. If you don't have a garden, you can give it to your community garden, you can give it to a local farmer. Uh, and it's, it's simple ways you can do things. You can change your diet so you're actually eating foods that are more regeneratively raised, that are more sustainable, that are, are good for you and good for the planet. I outline all that in the book. I call it the Pegan Diet. Uh, you can do stuff in your community. You know, if you have somebody who's, uh, you know, you got kids, you can work in your schools to reform the school system. I talk about how to do that and what the resources are. Um, you can actually also vote with your vote and become more active, whether you, whether you actually uh, you know, want to become politically active or not, you can maybe give to somebody who is, is doing more work, like the Food Policy Action Network or Environmental Working Group, if you want to sort of help donate, so you can vote with your wallet. And then there's a great group, the Food Policy Action Group, where you can look at your congressmen and senators and see what are they voting on. Are they voting for a good policy or bad policy when it comes to food and ag? And they get scored. And you can sort of make noise and people actually listen to that. So there's a lot of ways we can do that. And of course, then we need business innovation. We need incentives that are, so for regenerative ag, we need incentives to get farmers to do that. We need policy change where we can reform food stamps and put nutrition back in the food stamp. We need better school lunches. We need to change the way in which the FDA labels food so it's clear and you know what you're eating. We need maybe soda taxes to help. We need incentives for good food and disincentives for bad food. All these are laid out in the book. We can create food as medicine prescriptions for doctors to actually treat people with food as medicine. We can get Medicare to reimburse that. So there's a lot of really exciting things that are on the table that I lay out in the book, and it's gonna require a massive grassroots effort. Uh, you know, I'm really excited about the book, but I'm also excited about this movement that we're building with, with real people who know how to get done in Washington and change policy. And, and so we're going to be activating all kinds of coalitions and groups, academics, scientists, farmers, you know, policymakers, you know, scientists, doctors, all of us together working to solve these problems. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's called the Food Fix Campaign. Uh, and so stay tuned for that. We're going to be launching that in May. And it's, it's, uh, it's the, uh, I think, most important thing I've ever done because we, we actually have to solve this or we're, we're screwed. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, you can count me in as a big supporter, but there's also some other incentives for people to get started now. Everybody needs to get a copy of this book. 
But if you pre-ordered right now, you also get access to some bonuses. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you can go on foodfixbook.com. I've created a, a video called Five Steps to a Healthier Plan and a Healthier You, which is a great action plan for you. There's an incredible action a guide so you don't have to be confused about what to do, what you can do as an individual, what you can do in your community, whether you want to start a community garden or get your local municipality to start a composting initiative. I mean, there's so much that we can all do. We have to jump in. And uh, there's also this great longevity course. I've created a longevity masterclass because I'm 60. I want to stay healthy a long time. So I got to fight this fight. I need another at least 30, 40 years so I can kind of push through and fight this fight because it's not going to be overnight. And I've, I've collated all my learnings and expertise as a functional medicine doctor, understanding what causes to age, how to reverse it. And, I, you know, my biological age, I'm 60, but my biological age is 39. Amazing. So I'm doing good. Amazing. And, yes. and I think I want to share all those insights with people. So there's a lot of resources there that you can plug into at foodfix.com. Foodfixbook.com. Perfect. Foodfixbook.com. Um, you're one of my favorite humans. Thank you. Know, you I've Sean. learned a lot from you Thank over the you. years. Thank you. And I remember sitting at that apartment in Ferguson, Missouri, and uh -huh. I just really worked to turn my health around. Yeah. And I remember finding you on YouTube. Oh, yeah. And it was a video. <laughs> and you dropped this nugget. And I was still in college at the time. Yeah. And you said that food isn't just food. It's information. It's information. Literally Boom. changed my right. mind, changed my outlook on life in that moment. Yeah. And I just crazy. want to thank you so much for continuing to innovate, continuing to focus on being the best you possible. Thank you. And I know what goes into creating a book like this, and I'm just excited to be a part of this. With thank you. you. Yeah, that was that was like a long time ago. That was 15 years ago. I was doing video blogs, and I, I think they had dial-up. It was pretty bad. It was yeah, pretty I think this was fuzzy. This and... was about 18 years ago. Maybe. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, amazing. I, amazing. I've been on this fight a long time, but this is this is really the most important work I've ever done because it sort of puts together everything that is wrong with the world, connects the dots, and gives us a roadmap out. Yeah, awesome foodfixbook.com. Hmm. Awesome, Mark. Thank you so much for Thanks, hanging out Sean. with us. Everybody, thank you for hanging out with us today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this episode. I just want to share this with you because, again, for a lot of industry, it it's about that triple bottom line. You know, it's a win, 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 and looking at how can they actually make money or save money by doing some of these things. Why would a soda company be invested in selling less soda, right? How can we save money with insurance, right? This isn't a small thing. Businesses aren't going to make these moves unless they're pushed to through making money or saving money. And so he highlights in the book, and this was um, research recruited from Medicaid and Medicare patients and split them into groups that either received nutritious, healthy meals or did not receive nutritious meals. The study found something really astonishing. The patients who had nutritious meals had fewer hospital visits, ultimately resulting in a 16% reduction in their health care costs. And that was after deducting meal expenses. So that's taking out the cost of the food. The average monthly medical cost for a patient in the nutrition group shrank to about $843, much lower than the roughly $1,413 in medical costs for each patient in the control group. Saving money. Yeah. Saving money, feeling better, preventing illness. This is where we need to point our attention as we move forward. This isn't a small thing. This is the biggest issue that we have at hand in our society today. And we think, again, Mark started off talking about these things seem separate, climate change, political unrest, but this is really all tied to a common entity, which is our food. And again, I'm really excited about this book and this mission, and I've got some stuff coming to really mirror and support this as well. But I want you to make sure to pick up Food Fix right now, foodfixbook.com. Get those bonuses, get those five free videos, and get more actionable items on what you can start to do right now. And listen, I appreciate you so much. This isn't a, uh, a race issue. This isn't a, a political issue. This is a people issue. Mm -hmm. And all of us really working together to change our world for the better and kind of leaning back on our ancestors who were thinking generations ahead you know what kind of world are we going to leave for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and we have the opportunity right now with how we take action and i appreciate you for taking action and tuning in with us today make sure to share this out with the people you care about on social media tag me tag mark let us know what you thought about the episode we've got some epic powerhouse stuff coming your way very soon so make sure to stay tuned take care have an amazing day and i'll talk with you soon